and welcome to another edition of the Sabbath School Study Hour recorded right here in the Granite Bay Hilltop Seventh-day Adventist Church in the greater Sacramento area of California. My name is Pastor Sean Brumman and I have the privilege of bringing to you this week's lesson study. And uh, not only that, but I get the privilege of introducing our new study and quarterly for 2024. And so just a happy new year to all of you as we are starting this very a uh, brand new year together, and uh, there's uh, hard to find a better book in the Bible uh, to give us encouragement as we make our way through this new year, as well as many vital truths, including the gospel of Jesus Christ. So uh, friends, again, we're going to be studying the book of Psalms, and uh, that's the simple title of this uh, first quarter of 2024 for our quarterly. If you don't have a copy of this, by the way, make sure you go down to your local Seventh-day Adventist church and uh, ask for a free copy. It's hard to find a church that doesn't have a free copy for you. And uh, so go ahead and take advantage of that if you haven't already. Well, before we get into our study here today, um, I'd like to take advantage of this time to be able to give you a free gift offer. And uh, if you live in, in North America or any of the U.S. territories, we can mail this out to you. All you have to do is pick up your phone and dial 1-866-788-3966. And uh, again, that's 1-866-788-3966 or 1-866-STUDY-MORE. If you happen to live in the United States and you would like a digital copy of this on your phone, you can do that today. And all you need to do is text the code SH163 and you want to dial that to the number 40544. And uh, go ahead and take advantage of that for a free digital download. And if you live outside of the USA and Canada, all you have to do is go to the website study.aftv dot org front slash sh163 well friends uh, i'm going to uh, start by reading one of my favorite passages and it's not in the book of psalms uh, believe it or not but it's in the book of revelation and it's found in revelation chapter 15 and verses 2 through 4 that's revelation 15 and verses 2 through 4 and of course this is an introduction to our first week study which is entitled how to read the Psalms. And so uh, again, Revelation 15, starting with the verse two says, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And verse three tells us what we're doing. It says, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. Your judgments have been manifested. And so friends, the very same thing that that last generation that Revelation here is revealing for you and me is going to be doing is the same thing that is also being done when we approach and start to study the book of Psalms. And that is that when we come to Revelation as well as Psalms, we find a scene of victory, of praise, of song. In Revelation's case, it's the last generation of the faithful and the saved that are living after Jesus comes again. And, uh, and it's the main theme of the book of Psalms as well. I'd like to start our study here today by going through a bit of a, an exercise together. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, a couple of different sentences from the last six Psalms of the book of Psalms. Now, for some of you who've counted and are acquainted with the book, and you know that there's 150 Psalms. Uh, we're just going to look at the last six. And again, I'm going to read a sentence or two sentences from each of those Psalms. And I want to challenge you uh, to be able to find out what they have in common. So here we go. Psalm 145, it says, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. And then verse 21, it also says, my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Psalm 146, verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. Verse 10 says, The Lord shall reign forever. 
your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Psalm 147, verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is beautiful. He has not dealt thus with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. Then we come to Psalm 148. Verse 1 says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the highest. In verse 14, And he has exalted the horn of his people, horn representing strength, the praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. Psalm 149, verse 1. Some of you are probably picking up already what's in common. It says, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, and his praise in the assembly of saints to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. Then Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so, friends, I think it's obvious for you and I what that common theme is through those last six uh, psalms of this very powerful book called the Book of Psalms, and that is none other than praise. And, uh, and this is no small truth. This is the main theme that threads all the way through the entire book of uh, Psalms. And where did these uh, verses that we just uh, read from come from? Well, it was the first and last sentence of each of those six last Psalms of the book of Psalms. Did a bit of a word search and uh, a word study on praise in the book of Psalms. And as it turns out, there is 361 times that the authors were inspired by God to write the word praise. And so I, see, I think that we can all agree that that would make praise a very prevalent theme within the book of Psalms. Well, as it turns out, when we look at a bit of a history, as well as our present Jewish friends today, they uh, actually refer to the book, what we call the book of Psalms in the Christian Bible. They refer to in their Bible, the Old Testament scriptures, as Sefer Talahim, which is uh, Hebrew meaning book of praises. And, uh, and so, of course, our Hebrew and Jewish friends were able to catch on to that theme very strongly through the centuries and even today. Where did the Christian Bible come to call this Old Testament book the book of Psalms? Well, they adopted it from a Greek word, which is psalmos. And uh, the Greek meaning for that Greek word is a song sung to harp music. And, uh, and so this also is very fitting because as it turns out, every single psalm, all 150 of them, were actually originally composed as songs. And uh, so not only were they inspired prophetically by God as intended to be the word of God, the word of truth for you and I, but they are very unique from the rest of the scriptures in the fact that this part of the Bible and every single psalm is not really a chapter within the book, but they are an independent song of worship that was intended to be used originally as worship as well as a revelation of infallible truth, the word of God itself. And, uh, and so now you can correct your friends uh, as they make that very common but very sincere mistake where they say, let's go to the book of Psalms, chapter 150. And you can say, you know, wait a minute, friend, there actually is no chapters in the book of Psalms. Um, it, is a hundred, it is a collection and a book uh, of 150 different songs. And uh, each one is independent one from uh, the other. And so we're looking at a very unique book when we look at the book of Psalms. The Psalms is a collection of prophetic ancient songs used in temple worship. And um, it's sung uh, to a variety of different ancient instruments. And so even, the, even though we have adopted, or Christians very many long years ago had adopted the Greek word psalmos, which means a song sung to the music of a harp. Um, harp was probably the most common music, uh, musical instrument used, but it was not the only one. And you can even read that within the Psalms itself as they talk about the various instruments that were used as they worshiped the Lord and as they used the lyrics and the compositions of the original Psalms that God had first inspired for Israel. 
Now, that being said, I do have to confess that uh, I'm not alone, as I've talked to other Christians as well, in uh, just wishing that we had just one of the musical compositions of the different psalms. As far as I am aware, there is no more preservation of the original tunes that the lyrics of these different psalms were originally sung to. And, uh, but I think it would be pretty special if we could even get the tune to one of those psalms and be able to sing it according to the original composition of the author that first composed it. All right, so I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with me to a New Testament text because even though we're studying the Old Testament book of Psalms, we find that in the book of James chapter 5 and verse 13, we have a number of, of uh, uh, verses there, uh, or in the New Testament, I should say, that, that makes it very clear to us, even as the quarterly points us to that as well, that, uh, that the Psalms were very prevalent in the mind and the worship and the lives of the first generation of the Christian church and through the centuries that followed. And so we find that very clearly as an example in, in James chapter 5, verse 13, it says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. And, uh, and so here we have James under inspiration pointing us back to the psalms when we're cheerful. Uh, why would that be? Well, of course, James is assuming that you understand the book of Psalms and you're acquainted with it and you're not going to go to the precatory Psalms or some of these more sober uh, uh, contemplative Psalms and calling for justice and so on in a very unfair and evil world. But, uh, but as the most prevalent theme is through most of the Psalms, including the ones we looked in the last six of the collection, are ones of praise and uh, worship and gratefulness and thankfulness to God. And uh, James is saying, if you're cheerful, if you're going through a good window of your life right now, sing psalms to the Lord from your heart. And, uh, and so that's the recommendation that we find to the Christian church and you and I as well. Well, friends, if there's one thing that I have experienced as I've read this ancient hymnal of the past is that there is no other book in the Bible that is, I would say, is more comprehensive and all-inclusive in regards to perhaps every single facet and experience and circumstance that you can have in this life. And uh, I'm not the first one to, um, to be able to see that and to acknowledge it because there has been many greater men than I that have come before me that also have seen that. I'm sure there's many men and women today that also would agree as well. When you look at the introduction to the quarterly itself, it quotes from Martin Luther. And Martin Luther himself also says that it is so comprehensive that it would be very difficult not to find some psalm that would apply to your experience in your life, even right now and at every moment that you experience in this lifetime. Uh, the psalms I have discovered speak of life's highs. It also speaks of life's lows. It talks about war, but it also talks about peace. Um, it talks about God's judgment, but it also talks about God's forgiveness. They speak of the, the, the Messiah to come, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. It talks about God the Father. It talks about the Holy Spirit. It talks about jubilation, but it also speaks of lamentation and, uh, and, and the lows of life as well. The Psalms I've discovered speak of God's law, but they also speak of God's much-needed grace. They speak of the eternally lost, and they speak of eternal salvation. It speaks of destruction, but the Psalms also speak of creation. It speaks of God's mercy, but they also speak of God's justice. They speak of God's long suffering, but it also talks about God's wrath. They speak of God's power, and they speak of man's weakness. They speak of God's wisdom, and, but they also speak of men's foolishness. It talks about God's eternal existence, and it also talks about God's man's life being nothing but a vapor. Here today and gone tomorrow. They speak of the living and the Psalms also address the dead. They speak of the wickedness of this world and they also address the righteousness that God calls us into. The Psalms also tell us about fear, but it also encourages us to trust. They speak of truth, but they also point out there is error. They speak of a broken, uncontrite heart, but it also warns us of the dangers of pride. They speak of God's protection but it also speaks of God's abandonment. 
They speak of God's sovereignty. That was one of my favorites. And they speak of man's servanthood. They speak of both history as well as prophesy the future. The Psalms speak of obedience and the importance of it in the life of a believer, but it also speaks of moral falls that God's believers experience as well. They address our spiritual apathy, but they also address revival and encourage it. They speak of affliction and they speak of man's cry of distress. They speak of deliverance offered from a God of holiness. They speak of being rich and speak of being poor. They talk of God's benevolence to a fallen human race. And they also speak of God's ungratefulness to a kingdom based on grace. They speak of satisfaction that can only be found in God. And they also speak of a lack of traction where the godless may trod. They speak of God's word as man's only guide of hope. And they also speak of God's presence as our only way to cope. They speak of stillness. They speak of meditation, remembrance of God's ways. And they also speak of singing and shouting and dancing with great praise. And as a reading of the Psalms brings us through life's road of faith, with all its ups and downs, it climaxes with the emphasis that is thematic throughout the entire music collection. And that is praise, praise, praise. Could it be that we need more praise of God in our life? I have to confess, when I came back to the Psalms and I began to read several of them, as well as the quarterly and the different Psalms that it pointed me to, I find myself more full of praise. I hadn't revisited the book of Psalms for some time as a whole, reading Psalm after Psalm after Psalm and so on. And I have to confess that by the time I went to bed last night and when I went up, got up in the morning, I found my mind and my heart more full of praise. I was praising God as I was coming to, as I was getting out of bed, as I was going to the bathroom and making my way through the first parts of the day and getting ready for it. There's something that rubs off when you read the Psalms and it gives you a spirit of praise and worship and gratefulness before your God. Have you praised God for his good works and mercy in your life lately? Are your heart zealous for the praise of God on a regular basis? In prayer, in song, in worship, in word, Friends, if you've never read through the book of Psalms, I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to read through it from the beginning to end as a whole book. Experience the Psalms. Now, I've probably said this more than once during our Sabbath school study hour that because I say it over and over and every opportunity I find myself teaching the word of God and that is I encourage you to read the whole word of God. If you have never read the Bible, friends, I want to encourage you to read the Bible. And, uh, and to be able to experience that as a whole. But if you haven't read the whole book of Psalms, I want to encourage you to read from the beginning to end, even as we make our way through this quarterly study for the next three months. Make it a goal that in the next three months, now friends, that's less than two Psalms a day. Now some of them are a little bit longer, but the most of them are only take one to three minutes to read. Uh, friends, read through the whole book of Psalms during this quarterly. And I promise you, by personal experience, you know, I have to make a confession. When I first came to the book of Psalms, as I was reading through the whole Bible, I wasn't just aiming for the book of Psalms, but as I made my way to the book of Psalms, and I began to read through it for the first time, I thought, okay, this is where I can kind of relax. It's going to be a little bit more superficial, a little bit more, maybe superficial is not the right word, but a little bit more um, basic or simple. And, uh, and so we're not going to be into any kind of deep Bible study and spiritual experience like the books previous or after. And uh, friends, by the time I was halfway through this book, I was saying to my wife, I said, this is, this is the, one of the richest, most amazing books that you can find in all the Bible. And my perspective on the book of Psalms changed dramatically and has changed ever since. I did not realize how deep the depths go in regards to the ex experiences of life compared to that of even some of the other books of the Bible. And, uh, and so, friends, you may find that it will exceed your expectations and it will be a much richer experience than you ever anticipated. That was my experience. 
Well, friends, there's another important thing that we need to pick up, a very important theme and truth. Yes, praise is the prevalent theme through it. Um, faith, many of life's experience, but we need to also understand and look for Jesus throughout the Psalms as well. As it turns out, the book of Psalms is a very deep prophetic book that was looking forward before Jesus came incarnate into this world. And it revealed a lot of the different life experiences and details and teachings of the person of Jesus when he came and became one with us in the human race. And, uh, and now we have the privilege of looking back and seeing all of those different details and how they've been fulfilled perfectly in the earthly life teachings uh, of Jesus himself just 2,000 years ago. Uh, we find Jesus right from the second Psalm on. So you don't have to go far into the Psalms to be able to find Jesus. Jesus is there front and center in the very second Psalm. And friends, there are dozens after that that refer sometimes in depth and sometimes just a key little detail or two concerning the life, teachings, and experience of Jesus. And uh, so look for Jesus. It prophesies of him. One of those key examples is found in the... Uh, in the book of Psalms. And uh, if we go to Psalm 16, this is no small psalm because it reveals the sole prophecy of that key detail that is not concerning the death and sufferings of Jesus uh, or the birth of Jesus as we're focusing on more now as we approach the Christmas season, but it's actually focusing on the prophesying and the prediction and promise of Christ's resurrection after he suffers and dies for the sin of the world. And so we come to Psalm 16. It says, therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in Sheol. And that is referring to the grave, the dark place of the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And so, friends, this is referring to Christ because it says, nor will you allow... Now, this is written by King David, the prophet David, but indeed David is talking about more than just his own personal experience, but he's talking about the experience of Jesus. Um, why? Because it says, you will not leave my soul, that is his whole person, including his body, in Sheol the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And indeed, that is true. When Jesus was buried on a Friday, late Friday afternoon, he came to glory very, very early on Sunday morning. And so friends, um, God did not allow him to stay in the grave nor experience the corruption, corruption meaning not moral corruption as we're more acquainted with it when we talk about politics or business and, and, uh, and the justice system and so on. But this corruption is talking about um, our body's de decomposition that takes place after we die and we turn back to the dust of the earth. And uh, so it says that Jesus would not experience that decomposition of his physical body, but rather instead he would raise to glory as he did. And, uh, and of course, is the hope of the gospel of every believer. And, uh, and so this is a very powerful key example of Jesus being found uh, in the Psalms. All right, friends, I want to invite you to come to Sunday on the quarterly itself. And on Sunday, um, you know, it talks about a number of different things in regards to uh, the Psalms being that of uh, worship. Uh, indeed, worship was the central facet and um, uh, focus and use of the Psalms. It certainly was not the only one. And that same day in the quarterly study teaches us that. Uh, the, the Jewish people would traditionally use a number of different song, psalms and sing them as they originally composed for uh, to different tunes. And they would sing those on their pilgrimages to the three annual feasts in Jerusalem that God commanded God's people to attend as they made their way to the city of Jerusalem for those feasts as well as their way back. Uh, there was different psalms or halals as... Uh, the quarterly teaches us are called by our Jewish friends and were called even back in Jesus' day. And uh, they would sing that some certain psalms before uh, the Passover meal. And then there was other ones that they would sing following the Passover meal as well. There were certain ones that, uh, in particular, the ones that we read, those last ones in the collection, Psalm 145, 46, 47, 48, 49, and 50, 
were used on a daily basis in the synagogue services for their daily morning services as well. And um, so sometimes, yes, it was uh, for collective worship in synagogues and at the temple. And, uh, and sometimes it was also used um, for, um, for personal and, uh, and traveling encouragement and worship and praise of God um, as well. Well, 1 Chronicles 16, verse 7, uh, tells us something very helpful in regards to uh, the use of psalms in worship. It says, On that day David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. And so here we have David. Now, David was one of the most prolific and the most extensive and most prominent writer of the psalms. And, uh, and David was no small musician, as many of you are aware but he was a very extremely gifted uh, musician as well. And so here we find him delivering one of the psalms that God had led his hand to compose, and he gives it to Asaph, which is the head of the mus musicians and that leg or department of the Levites in Jerusalem and at the temple. Psalm 95 we're also pointing to as well. Verses 1 and 2, it says, O come and let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Now, of course, uh, verse, and then late after that, it says, let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. And, uh, and so here we find the psalm itself, and it says, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Now again, friends, this is very clearly pointing us and directing God's people to be able to collect the psalms and use them, especially when they had the tunes for them, to be able to sing before the Lord in collective uh, worship. And, um, and then we go to Monday. And when we find ourselves in Mondays, we, it's entitled Meet the Psalmists. Uh, again, King David is the predominant author and prophet who wrote most of the Psalms. Uh, again, David was very gifted. He had many talents, both on the battlefield, in the um, political realm, and uh, of course, spiritual realm. Uh, but he also was very, very definitely uh, an accomplished musician and very talented indeed. He began developing his gift very early on. Many of us can recall reading the historical books of the Old Testament and uh, there we find that David, even before he was anointed as king, he found himself not only shepherding the sheep, but he, he covered and, and, and spent a lot of his time while he was looking over those sheep, praying before the Lord, and then also composing different psalms, different songs. And, uh, and I dare say that more than one of the psalms that we find in that musical collection of the Bible was composed by David even during those early years when he was a humble shepherd boy in the field watching over his dad's and family's sheep. David is also on record of bringing a tremendous amount of musical organization to Jerusalem once he became king and the political leader of the country. Uh, David was not just a king, as many of you know. He was not just a musician only. He was not just a very accomplished soldier in general in the battlefield. But David was also uh, very much into uh, uh, bringing together the religious community, bringing together Israel and helping them to be able to see and to, and to accept the Lord in their heart and follow him and love him as much as David did. Indeed, David was known as a man after God's own heart. If there's ever a person in the Bible that we can find that had a personal relationship with God in all its sincerity, it was King David. And, uh, and he used that, that power that he had, that, that political clout that he had to be able to organize uh, the Levites and the priesthood in such a way that glorified God, followed the, 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 the directions of God in regards to that worship, and then to add to that the musical worship. And so he, he organized a choir. He had full-time professional singers. He had players of instruments that were hired full-time among the Levites simply to lead God's people to worship God. And, uh, and so this tells us a number of different things. First of all, it tells us how important worship is. Uh, second of all, it tells us what an important element music is in the worship of God. 
And we find that in the writings of many of the great uh, Christian leaders, pastors over the years. Uh, Ella White, under the spirit of prophecy, also expressed that music is a very powerful evangelistic tool to lead people to accept Christ and to see and live in the gospel. And so uh, music is not just an extracurricular nicety, but music has always been designed uh, by God in the context of worship to win people's hearts and to encourage God's believers in the faith. In 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 23 and verse 1, uh, it says here, Now these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, Thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. And so David was very famous for a number of things. Even today he's famous on a number of different levels and different ways. Um, But one of those ways is that he was known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. He loved to compose and to play music. Well, like the other authors of the Psalms, uh, David was not an ordinary songwriter. And I think it's important for us to stop and address this. And it's addressed a couple different ways and a couple different times in this week's quarterly study. And, uh, and that is that, um, that, uh, that David uh, was more than just a songwriter when he penned those different songs. Um, now, it's true that God inspires and leads people musicians even today, to compose music and songs of worship. Um, God has been doing that through all of the centuries. Um, Those are what you would call talented, passionate, very capable, and for many of them, very accomplished musicians. And they compose some beautiful songs. You know, we have our Seventh-day Adventist hymnal that have classics that God has inspired and gifted different musicians over the centuries to be able to write, and uh, some of those still inspire us, and we still use those in worship today. Uh, Since the hymnal was created, there's also been additional, many additional songs that God has continued to inspire, gifted, spirit-led Christian songwriters. And those are all inspired, even as my sermons are inspired, even as we have different pastors around the world today that have the Spirit of God working with His Spirit, working with the angels, working most importantly with the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, to be able to bring the truth of the Bible to the people. Now that's on a different level than the songwriters that wrote the Psalms. And this is where the confusion can sometimes be. We want to reduce the Psalms to just simply some songs that were written in a deep way by some deep thinking, believing songwriters. No, the Psalms are just as much the infallible, revealed, perfect will of God and word of God as the rest of the scriptures are. And so that makes them very unique in a class of their own, much different from the other songs that God has worked with musicians over the centuries to develop. And so when we come to uh, the Word of God, for instance, we know that it is infallible. If I'm reading from Ezekiel chapter 8, I read it all the way through, you can be assured that every sentence there is perfect truth. Um, When I start to add some of my own ideas, you have to discern. Why? Because I'm not a prophet. I'm not writing on the same level that Ezekiel wrote. And the same with the Psalms that are written in this musical uh, collection as well. David was endowed with the spiritual gift of prophecy. Uh, While many of his Psalms were expressions of his personal life experience, both some of his good experiences as well as some of his bad experiences, he was writing as a prophet. He was revealing the word of God both to Israel as well as to mankind. Because David was a significant type or symbol of the coming Messiah who eventually came in the person of Jesus Christ himself, we find there that many of David's Psalms blended some of his personal experience with also some very important key details uh, and teachings concerning the life, the experience, as well as the teachings of Jesus Christ himself. 
And, uh, and so again, friends, we find deep prophecies that are blended in with the experience of David, sometimes separate, like we did in verse 16. Of course, David's body did see corruption. And so we know that that particular statement in that psalm, even though that psalm also reflected much of David's personal experience at that point in life, it also revealed a unique, exclusive experience that Jesus was only to experience himself. And, uh, and so we find this very fascinating blending uh, of the two, David's experience and Jesus' experience. Again, some of them overlap and they both experience those emotions or details in life. Sometimes they're exclusive only to David or only to Jesus as well. Again, we can find that example in Psalm 16, as I just pointed out as well. I'd like to invite us to look at another example, and we find that in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, starting with verse 43. We're coming to a conversation uh, that Jesus is having publicly with some of the religious Jews and rabbis of his day. And, uh, and it says, and he said to them, that is, Jesus said to his crowd, how then does David in the spirit, that's with the capital S, the Holy Spirit, how does David then in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And so here Jesus is quoting from one of David's songs, or as we more commonly call it, a psalm. And, um, and so here it says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand tell I make your enemies your footstool. So here we have the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, which is none other than Yahweh or Jehovah, the great I am. And, uh, and the Lord is saying to my Lord. Now the my here is none other than King David. It's a first person reference to the author himself, which in this case is David. And so the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And so David here is quoting from a conversation between the father and between the Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus points that out. And he says, well, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Now, a father, earthly father, would never call an earthly son his Lord. David is talking about a future ancestor. In this case, it's Jesus. And, uh, and Jesus, uh, David, would never refer to one of his great-grandsons as Lord. It would always be the other way around. His great-grandson would refer to his father David or great-great-great-grandfather David as Lord. If David, Jesus goes on, then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him uh, anymore. And so here we have Jesus not referring to a psalm and quoting from it because he wants to lead his crowd in worship. Do you see that difference, friends? Not because he says, hey, let's stop and take a break and sing a psalm. No, Jesus is quoting this theologically and prophetically because Jesus understood that the songwriters that wrote the psalms were writing the word of God. And so did his listeners understood that as well. And therefore, he was able to make a point that they didn't like to see because then it also demonstrated that Jesus would be a literal descendant of David, even as he was the son of Joseph and Mary of that same royal lineage. And, uh, and so Jesus here is using the psalm on a different level for a different reason, even as he wants us to also see and use the Psalms as well. And that's probably why he hasn't seen fit to preserve the tunes that go with it, the compositional musical tunes that go with the lyrics of the Psalms, because that is not really relevant to our generation today, but he has still preserved it and made sure it's in the scriptures because there is deep theological infallible truth that he wants us to see there as well. And that also tells us, as Jesus used it, that he understood the Psalms were indeed authoritative, theological, and prophetic, infallible truth. And, uh, and so that's important for us to be able to understand as well. It says that David was in the spirit. 
uh, when he wrote this, when he wrote the psalm? Does that mean that he had this spiritual gift of prophecy? Does that mean that he was receiving something that is much more important and more authoritative than the ordinary Christian songwriter? And the question, the answer to that is a definite yes. Um, Revelation chapter 1 is a prime example for you and I. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, John, whom of course we, without argument, accept as somebody that definitely had the spirit of prophecy, definitely was a bona fide prophet writing on the infallible truth and word of God. Um, and he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice. And then he goes on to start to express the things that he heard and saw in those prophetic visions. And, uh, and so you can see that parallelism there between David being in the spirit, John being in the spirit, David writing a psalm, and John writing the great prophetic book of Revelation. We also find additional evidence for David's prophetic uh, inspiration as well in Acts chapter 2 and verse 30. And uh, in fact, this one's so important. I, we have the time here today, so I'm going to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles. If you have a paper Bible, go ahead and open that with me. If you have an electronic one, I want to invite you to uh, go ahead and do that as well, because I'd like to look at an actual passage in which this quote from Acts chapter 2 verse 30 is taken from. So we're going to the book of Acts. This is no small day. In chapter 10, we have the day of Pentecost, one of the annual feasts that the Jews have been observing for centuries. And uh, this day of this Pentecostal feast was unlike any other one before because now God was fulfilling the typology, the symbology of that ancient annual Jewish feast by preaching the gospel to those who were in Jerusalem, bringing the first fruits that was symbolized in the Feast of Pentecost. And that is in 3,000 plus souls that had come to see Jesus, accept him as the Savior, find themselves baptized both in water and in the Holy Spirit. As we come into the very heart or the actually the, the, the closing words of that famous sermon that Peter is on record of preaching to the crowds of his Jewish countrymen in the streets of Jerusalem, we come to verse 25 as Peter now is making a point prophetically from the Psalms, even as Jesus did from a different Psalm. I think Jesus was quoting from Psalm 110, if I remember correctly. In this case, Peter is using Psalm 16, which is the one that we studied and looked at earlier today. For David says concerning him, that's capital H, him, Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades. Hades, in this case, is referring to the grave, parallel to that of Sheol in the Old Testament. Nor will, I, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Again, that's the decomposition of his body. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Finish quote. And so here Peter is quoting from another Psalm of David as an authoritative prophetic word of God to make a theological point. And it worked. Verse 29, Peter goes on and says, Men and brethren, let me speak to you freely of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. In other words, he said, listen, David's body saw corruption long, long before our generation. That's the generation of Peter. He's saying, listen, it's been a long time, and uh, indeed his body has come back to nothing but dust. And we know exactly where that dust is located, even in Peter's day. By the way, I've been in Jerusalem. I've been in Israel about 10, 13 years ago. And at that time, anyway, the guy had no idea where that tomb was in our generation. But in Peter's day, they knew. You have to remember, this is a thousand years after David was buried. Verse 30, it says, Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseen this, in other words, God gave David prophetic eyesight far into the future, a thousand years in this case, 
foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, not left in the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption. And again, that corruption is the decomposition of his physical body. And, uh, and so here we find that David is making a point. And by, by the way, in verse 34, that same passage, it says, For David did not ascend into the heavens. And, and so on. And so we know that David is still waiting for that future resurrection that every believer goes into the grave waiting for. And so even though your body and ours and mine will one day see corruption if the Lord does not come first, and it will decompose back into the dust of the earth, it won't stay there. And that's the good news of the gospel, isn't it? And Peter understood that as well, is that even though David was still in the dust, in the tomb in which they knew was existing in their day, that dust will not stay there, but God will make David whole again. And that's a whole other subject. Um, he's even going to have upgraded bodies uh, for us. There's going to be some amazing new technology that we're going to inherit when Jesus comes. Uh, Jesus says that you and I will be like the angels. And uh, the Bible tells us that angels can travel faster than the speed of light. And so obviously we're going to have some new technology in the new bodies that God has in store for us. And so why are we spending some time there? Again, we find just like Jesus did, now we have Peter, the prophet and apostle Peter, quoting before his hearers in an authoritative manner from a psalm of David as more than just an inspiring song for church worship on Sabbath morning, but also for deep, infallible theological truth for you and I concerning the life and death and resurrection of Jesus in this particular case. All right, well, there's some other authors that are also uh, uh, covered in the quarterly. And so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and turn there because it's just recorded so well for us. Um, and so we are going to uh, Monday. It says King David. We talked about him already. The New Testament att attests uh, to uh, David's authorship of various th Psalms. We looked at one example of Jesus. There's other examples. We looked at the example in Acts chapter 2. And, uh, and there's some other ones in chapter 4 and Romans chapter 4. Uh, for as well. Numerous songs were composed by the temple musicians who were also Levites. So these were full-time religious leaders and uh, workers. And uh, it tells us that there's about a dozen pointed out there that were written by Asaph, which was the chief musician during his um, tenure and uh, um, position as uh, Levite. Psalm 42, Psalm 44 to 47, 49, 84, 85, 87 to 88 were written by the sons of Korah. Okay, uh, again, a more prevalent uh, era and family within the Levites. And then Psalm 88, written by Haman. And then Psalm 89 by Ethan. And then uh, beyond that, we have some interesting uh, uh, authors there that I had neglected to remember until I came back to this quarterly, and that is that Solomon penned two psalms, Psalm 72 and as well as 127. And then we also have the great prophet Moses that wrote Psalm 90. And again, these are prophets that not only wrote the psalms, uh, some of the psalms, but uh, also wrote many of the other inspired theological books of the Bible. Well, when we come to meet these psalmists, uh, it's important to understand, again, as I've spent a few minutes now covering, that they were individuals that were called with the spirit of prophecy to give us infallible, theological, religious, prophetic truth. Um, but at the same time, just like the other prophets the Bible reveals, um, is that they also uh, uh, found themselves struggling, uh, struggling in their faith at times. They are on record in the Psalms of struggling with discouragement, struggling with temptations, uh, struggling with dealing with and coming to terms with the injustices that take place within a broken and, uh, and fallen world. Um, I have a feeling that you're not unlike myself as well as the psalmist and the fact that you also struggle with your faith at times. You also struggle with discouragement, temptations, uh, dealing with the evil injustices that take place in this world. Um, these can be challenges that come living in a broken world as well as living with a broken nature that is being sanctified by the Spirit of God as uh, God's Word and His Spirit take their, 
their, their effect upon us and make us more and more Christ-like over the years. But that's a process, isn't it? And, uh, and so we, we struggle with that. And then we come to Tuesday, which is entitled The Song for Every Season. And uh, we talked about that to some extent already at the beginning of how comprehensive and how wide-reaching is the theme of the book of Psalms. But uh, again, the, the quarterly points out on Tuesday's lesson uh, something helpful there in regards to some of the different literary tools. There's a number of literary and poetic tools that the author of the Psalms used. And, uh, and helpfully, the quarterly points that out for us. There's parallelism where you say the same thing twice, but with different words and in different ways to make that impact and make that point. And it's also a poetic tool. Imagery, figurative language, is quite often used uh, to appeal to the reader's physical senses and imagination and so on. And so that uh, uh, figurative language, similes, it's not written in here, but similes are very common as well, where you, you're communicating one truth by comparing it to something similar to it. Uh, there's also merism, where you're contrasting uh, a pair of uh, two different contrasting parts. Night and day before, uh, before God or before thee denotes crying without ceasing, day and night, 24-7. Uh, then we have word plays, where there is plays on words to make different puns and so on. And this brings up a really good point, not only for the book of Psalms, but for the whole Bible. And this is where we can find ourselves confused and in trouble sometimes when we're trying to properly interpret the Bible. You know, as Christians, we have a lot of voices in the world in general, it's an unbelieving fallen world that tells us that God's word is, is not infallible that the Holy Bible is not something we can trust, that it's inconsistent, that, it's, that it is fallible, that it has some serious theological and historical mistakes in it and such. And so in opposition to that, of course, Jesus and the apostles and you and I, as well as the prophets, understood and do understand that it is the infallible, perfect truth that God gives to us on religious, theological, historical, philosophical, moral, even health uh, areas in life. And so we want to take it all as it says. And, uh, and the mistake that sometimes we make is that we can become so zealous or unconsciously we approach it with that needful uh, faith that what it says is what it means and, uh, and we rule out the possibility that the authors were using these different literary tools and we want to take everything literally. And uh, certainly a great, vast portion of the Bible is literally written. When you read the book of Genesis, the predominant theme throughout it, although it does use some literary tools here and there in it, is a book of history. And so when God says that he created the earth in six days, six evenings and mornings, six 24-hour periods, he really meant that. That's a literal record of what literally happened. He literally made one man out of the dust and literally breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He literally took the literal rib out of the literal person of, of Adam and he made a literal woman. And, uh, and, and the two became one flesh and were literally married and began to reproduce and start the first family. This is all literal historical realities. But even later in the book of Genesis, you find there that Moses is taking upon himself to use figurative languages, to use similes, to use poetic tools, to use parallelisms, to use these different tools. And, uh, and so we have to pray that God helps us not only to recognize them, but to know what they're meaning and how they're being applied so that we can come to rightful and safe and, uh, and true interpretation and conclusions concerning the Word of God. All right, that being said, uh, let's go to uh, Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday talks about personal prayers. Um, it points out that important truth that, uh, again, as, as we talked about earlier, as David, the most predominant author of the Psalms, as well as the other authors, they're expressing their own personal experiences. And quite often, you'll find that there's this prevalent um, theme and, uh, and style within the writing of many of the Psalms is to write it as a personal prayer. And, uh, and we find that even in some of the uninspired, uh, unprophetic uh, uh, songs of the hymnals, as well as uh, um, more newer Christian songs, all of these different songs, uh, not all of them, but many of them are written uh, intended to, uh, in, in, in a 
in an address to God. And so it's in a prayer like setting in which we are actually singing and praying and talking to God at the very same time that we're singing these psalms or songs. And, um, and so that's another important uh, literary tool and style that we should understand and that we should make ourselves one with that psalmist and say, Lord, even as you are writing this, uh, you know, even as you inspired this psalm as a prayer to God for the original psalmist, I know that you have intended for me to lift this up from my heart as well. And to accept this as a prayer that you would have me bring it up before the Lord, even in my experience as well. And then when we come to Thursday, we find that it is the world of the Psalms. And the question is asked at the top, what place does God occupy in the psalmist's life? And, uh, and the answer to that is first place. Uh, you know, the psalmist understood and represent God as front and center within the very experience of the author themselves. And of course, that makes sense because as we said earlier, the psalmists are more than inspired songs by, 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 um, by talented musicians and composers, but they were actually prophets. They actually had the spirit of prophecy. And so, of course, God would be front and center. Other gods, otherwise, God would not have called them to pen part of the infallible word of God as well. And um, so I hope that helps, friends. Uh, we're just closing up our, our time here today. I'd like to read the last psalm. And, uh, and we read the first and last sentence at our opening there. But just as a close, I want to invite you to come together with me and not just to learn intellectually, but to speak from your heart as we come together and we praise the Lord. Psalm 150. And we think we have it also on the screen for us so that you could read it with me. It says, praise the Lord. There's that theme again, isn't it? Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him from, for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. And there we have the evidence of more than the harp only being accompanied. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Friends, did you notice the last three words of the last song of this powerful, inspired book of psalms and songs that God has given to you and me? It tells us indeed that we should have a life of praise. And so friends, I hope that that's above all inspires you not only to praise God on a regular basis, if you haven't been doing that already, but also to read the book of Psalms. Take it up. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Until we get together for the next lesson in this very powerful series, I want to invite you to have a blessed week and uh, we look forward to studying with you next week as well. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others.